very interesting. <laughs> I've got a new piece of equipment, a turbo molecular pump, specifically a split flow pump. However, before I explain what a split flow pump is and test if it actually works, it might be a good idea to quickly explain what a turbo molecular pump actually does. There are various types of vacuum pumps, with one of the primary distinctions being the pressure they can achieve. Diaphragm and rotary vein pumps are typically used for higher pressures. Membrane pumps, depending on how many stages they have, can achieve vacuums ranging from 80 millibars to 0.5 millibars. Those pressures fall within the so-called rough vacuum range. At a pressure of 0.5 millibar, the mean free path, which is the distance a gas particle can travel before colliding with another particle, is approximately 140 micrometers. By comparison, at atmospheric pressure, the distance is only about 70 nanometers, equivalent to the size of a small virus particle. Rotary vein pumps can achieve pressures as low as 10 to the power of minus 3 millibars. At this pressure, the mean free path is approximately 70 millimeters. However, at this point we encounter an issue. The gas particles are so far apart that there are practically no interactions between them. We have entered the realm of molecular flow, where the mean free path exceeds the volume of the chamber. At this stage, particles travel independently on straight paths through space, rendering the aforementioned pumps ineffective. They only work in the viscous flow range, where the air behaves somewhat like a liquid. Instead, high vacuum pumps like diffusion pumps or turbo molecular pumps are employed. There are also other types of pumps, such as cryo pumps, ion pumps, titanium sublimation pumps and others. But I am talking about turbo molecular pumps today. So, the gas particles move randomly through space at approximately the speed of sound, and one must wait for them to encounter the opening where the pump is connected. This is also the reason why it is preferable to choose a large diameter and a short distance when connecting a pump to a chamber. In a turbomolecular pump, the rotor spins at very high speeds. For instance, small models may rotate at about 90,000 rpm, while larger pumps like this one operate at approximately 30,000 rpm. Once a particle reaches the turbomolecular pump, the impulse of the rotor blades is transferred to the gas particle, essentially directing them downwards. Thus, the turbomolecular pump compresses the gas particles in the vacuum chamber, allowing them to be evacuated by the rotary vein pump. A split flow pump is essentially a turbomolecular pump that has been split in the middle. The upper stages of the rotor are separated from the lower ones. As a result, the pump doesn't have one opening, but two. This allows achieving two different pressures with just one pump, as there is a lower pressure at the upper flange than at the lower one. This fact is utilized in mass spectrometers, where different pressures are needed at different points in the system. These pumps are not actually intended to be connected to a regular vacuum chamber like mine. The manual explicitly states that this pump is intended for use only in mass spectrometers. But that won't stop me from connecting it to my chamber. However, before I do that, I should first test if the pump works at all. For the power supply, I am using a Pfeiffer TPS601, a power supply that I used for my large turbomolecular pump. From what I understand from the label on the controller, it accepts 24, 48, 72 or 140 volts. The TPS601 has a voltage of 140 volts, so it should work. However, after turning on the controller, it took a few minutes for it to display anything, and it only showed a solid red LED, indicating a collective malfunction according to the manual. So, I decided to open the controller up and check for any obvious faults. Since I lack expertise in electronics, I resorted to the only method I knew, searching for visibly damaged components or swollen capacitors. Unfortunately, this yielded no results. So I began testing all the capacitors with a multimeter. Luckily, I have another controller, a TC750 from my other turbomolecular pump at hand. While its outputs are different, the boards are very similar, and most capacitors had identical values. This allowed me to compare the capacitance without having to disorder the components. And I actually found several electrolytic capacitors with incorrect values. Consequently, I purchased replacements and swapped out the culprits. Let me tell you, removing components, especially those connected to a ground plane without a disordering station, was far from pleasant. As Shakespeare aptly put it, Words doth fail to portray the agony endured when solder doth not heat one's fervent plea. Nevertheless, after replacing all the capacitors, it was time to test if the controller now works. Okay. <laughs> Great. Since I didn't know why the mass spectrometer had been decommissioned, I still wasn't sure whether the controller was defective or if the pump itself was faulty. 
To find that out, I needed another TC600 controller that I knew worked. The only one I had was installed in my helium leak detector, which I had repaired some time ago. So reluctantly, I decided to dismantle it again. However, after a while, I realized that I could only get to the pump's controller by removing the entire pump. And I'm definitely not doing that. No, I'm not getting this out of there. <sighs> Nonetheless, I discovered a leak at the end of the hose for the oil drain and managed to fix it with some thread sealant. Yet, I made no progress in getting the pump mm. operational. I knew that the controller provides an error code via its RS-485 interface, but lacking a device like a Omnicontrol to read this code, I didn't attempt it at first. However, a helpful user from the Vacuum Discord server pointed me to Pfeiffer's software called TurboViewer and assisted me finding it on Pfeiffer's website. Many thanks for that. So I connected the pump to my computer via an RS-485 to USB adapter and attempted to connect the software to the pump. Using the software, I can now use the connection wizard to look for the device which is connected to the PC. And as you can see, it found the device. The thing is that it's not only a cool software to read out the error code, I'm probably using it to control the pump in the end if I get it to work, because you can see the revolutions per minute, the wattage, and in general control the pump. But if you look at the bottom right here, you can see error 002 over voltage, which means that the voltage provided by the power supply here is supposedly too high. And I don't quite understand that error because looking at the label of the controller, I interpret it in a way that it accepts either 24, 48, 72 or 140 volts. And the power supply I'm using right here has an output of 140 volts. I also measured it to confirm it. Okay, I have connected a 24 volt power supply to, in this case, the TC750 controller because I have two of those, but I only have one TC600 controller. And it wouldn't be the first time for me to mess something up regarding the wiring, so I will test it with this one first. Oh, yeah, we're getting a light. Great, so now let's try this with the other controller. No error message at all. <laughs> One sec. Oh. Okay, we get a blinking error message. That's a huge step in the right direction. Low voltage. Dude. <laughs> it's like this thing can't decide. <laughs> Maybe it wants 48 volts. <laughs> Since my only 48 volt power supply is defective and my benchtop power supply only goes to 40 volts, I have decided to connect a full bridge rectifier with two capacitors to smooth out the voltage to a variac and I can just um, adjust the voltage to see if there is a voltage the controller will accept. There is no LED indicating a fault. Let's connect to the pump. It's not spinning up, but it's making noise. Hmm, I'm not sure what's, what it's trying to do. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> I just got an electric shock. Honestly, I'm still not sure why I got an electric shock. Anyway, since it seemed like the pump wanted to start, I increased the voltage a little bit. And there you go. Oh! <laughs> Okay, let's stop here. <laughs> it's not bolted down to anything. Ooh, awesome! Mmm! That's just... <sighs> Great! Actually, by now I know what the problem with the 140 volt power supply was. Although the TC600 controller accepts voltages up to 140 volts, what it actually needs depends on the pump it's connected to. So you can't just use any of the specified voltages, you need to know what voltage the pump requires. After finding out that the pump needs 48 volts, I bought a Meanwell power supply, a nice aluminum case and a plug to build a suitable power supply. The only thing missing now is a flange with which I can connect the pump to my chamber and which also seals the lower opening of the pump. So I designed an adapter and now it's time to mill it out of this aluminum plate. Something is missing. And that's the sponsor of today's video.
Countless people still grow up without access to a lathe or a milling machine and have no way to realize their ideas. But PCBUA can help these people. In addition to PCBs, 3D printing in various materials, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding, PCBUA also offers CNC milling as a service. You simply upload the desired component, select a material and get an immediate price estimate. If you decide to have the parts made, you will have your self-designed parts in your hands a few days later. I have already used PCBWay CNC service several times and I have been more than satisfied with the results every time. So if you also live a sad life without a lathe or a milling machine and don't want to be restricted by it, you will find a link in the video description. A huge thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And now let's assemble everything. Technically this pump already has an ISO K100 flange, as you can see an ISO K100 o-ring fits perfectly. So I could just mount this ISO K100 tube on there, but the only way to clamp it would be this edge right here and the one on the other side. And I'm definitely not hanging this heavy pump off of two brackets, so that's why I designed the flange. Just in case it's unclear to some, the adapter plate simultaneously seals the lower opening of the pump. This allows me to only use the upper high vacuum connection. And I can clamp the pump to this adapter plate by using these brackets here I made. Since I really don't want this pump to get loose and there could be some vibrations, I will be using some thread locker in these threads right here. In case you are wondering why there is no screw here, but there is a hole, the reason is that I wanted to be able to just make two of these brackets here as the same part, and since they are mirrored, I have to have this empty hole right here. You may be wondering what these threaded holes here are for, and I will show you later on. I can't mount this adapter plate directly to my chamber because there is not enough space with the other flanges. That's why I have to attach this 10 cm extension right here. To clamp it down I will be using these custom clamps I designed, but in this configuration there is also an unused hole at the bottom right here, and this is just in case I wanted to use the standard ISO K clamps for this flange. By the way, I would like to thank Whistle Vacuum. They provided me with the ISO K100 tube. You will find a link to their website in the video description. And since I'm already getting a new pump for the vacuum chamber, I thought I would also expand the table for the chamber while I'm at it. This allows me to mount additional devices such as the power supply for the magnetron directly to the table. I have also attached a monitor that will in the future display important process parameters such as the pressure and the status of the turbo molecular pump. If you have watched the video this far, you might be interested in financially supporting this channel. You can do so by becoming a Patreon. You will find a link in the video description. And a huge thank you to all my current Patreons. Even small items like the connectors for the aluminum extrusions cost a lot of money, which I wouldn't be able to afford as a student without your support. So thank you very much. Luckily when designing this chamber I considered that I might get a bigger pump at some point and that's why I added this ISO K100 flange here. So that will be the flange where my new split flow turbo molecular pump will be mounted to. So let's try to add the new pump without dropping it. I could really need a second hand. With the pump now installed, let's talk about the part I mentioned earlier, the threaded ring inside the adapter plate. If we look through this viewport, we can directly look into the pump. You can see the shaft of the pump and also the ring I mentioned earlier. This ring enables me to install these threaded rods here. As you can see, the chamber is lined with aluminum foil. The reason for lining the chamber with aluminum foil is that I'm currently using the chamber to deposit metals on different surfaces via sputtering. And as you can see by the pretty titanium oxide colors, the metal basically gets everywhere, which means it would also coat the inside of the pump, or at least some part of it. That's why I had PCBWay make this stainless steel plate here for me, and it can be mounted onto the threaded rods. As you can see, when we are now looking down the viewport, the inside of the pump is protected by the stainless steel plate. 
Since this pump came out of a mass spectrometer, there is no KF flange to attach your roughing pump. Inside the mass spectrometer, the pump was just connected via this threaded hole here by using an adapter piece and a vacuum hose. Since I do not have an adapter which goes from this thread to a KF flange, I will just use a short piece of this hose here to attach a KF flange to this adapter here. Okay, everything is set up. I am currently using my laptop to connect to the pump, but in the future I want to permanently mount a PC to the stand here, so I can use this monitor here to monitor parameters like for example the turbomolecular pump or the pressure inside the chamber. So let's start by turning on the roughing pump so we can lower the pressure inside the chamber and then I will turn on the turbomolecular pump. I didn't look for a long time, but I haven't found a manual for this pump, probably because it is a specialized pump for a certain purpose. So I don't know for sure what pressure it needs to start, but I think 0.6 millibars should be enough. Besides the RPM and the wattage of the turbomolecular pump, I have also opened a window where you can see the pressure. I'm not expecting to achieve a record low pressure, because there's too much stuff in the chamber right now. All the aluminum foil and the sputtered metal. So it's just about whether or not the pump will reach its maximum RPM. The pump should start any second now. Oh, and it started. Oh, okay. <laughs> the noise was a little bit worrying, but it stopped. I'm not sure why it displays zero watts. 60,000 RPM seems to be its nominal speed, because that's where it stopped accelerating. And once it's up to speed, it actually doesn't sound bad. Okay, it is the next day now, and I have restarted the pump, and actually this time there were no vibrations noticeable. So I'm guessing the reason for the vibrations was that the pump was sitting for quite some time. It has been running for about 15 to 20 minutes now and we are at a pressure of 3.5 times 10 to the power of minus 5 millibars and I'm pretty satisfied with that. There seem to be no further problems with the pump, so it's a great success. I will off camera sort all of the cable mess back here, so it will be neatly tucked to the aluminum extrusions. I will also mount the power supply and the gauge controller permanently to my vacuum stand. A little teaser for an upcoming video is this quartz crystal thin film monitor I hope to get running soon. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Other than that, thank you a lot for watching. Oh, by the way, I read out the operation hours of this pump and it has been running for over 88,000 hours. That's more than 10 years of operational time. It will never cease to amaze me how long professional equipment can run.